The prevailing wisdom for success is pick a field and stick to it. Practice makes perfect after all. From exceptional athletes to exceptional violinists, people are advised to find a specialty. But my next guest, David Epstein, says we've got it all wrong. The best path to success is to explore widely and even fail. He's the author of the recent book, Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. David Epstein, pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. So I love this idea because, of course, I think of myself as a jack of all trades, which is, in your elevated form, a generalist. Um, why is, you know, we've often heard all about how actually it's very important to have a passion, to work 10,000 hours at things. Uh, why is it okay to, to be a jack of all trades? I think there's sort of two reasons. The first is that as the world becomes more specialized, experts, specialized experts who are still important, are seeing a smaller and smaller portion of the whole picture. And so these opportunities for generalists to synthesize information in technology, in science, in politics are greater than they've ever been before. And secondly, when we specialize too early, we miss out on our best, what economists call match quality, the degree of fit between your interests, your abilities, and the work that you do. And that's really important for both your motivation and your productivity to maximize that match quality. And so you need a period of sampling different things to try to maximize that. So that's a very important point, it seems to me, that you, you say that in order to figure out what you are good at, you can't do it theoretically. Uh, you can't imagine what you think you're... You can't even do it by just studying something. That's you right. actually have to engage in the practice. You know, you know, you have to try out stuff. And what do you call it? The learned experience is better. That's exactly right. So we learn who we are in practice, not in theory, as, as one of the researchers uh, I talked to says. And what she means is that we can't just introspect and decide what we're good at or, or what we might like. Right? Our, our insight into ourselves is constrained by our roster of previous experiences. So we learn who we are in practice by trying things, reflecting on those things, and then zigzagging accordingly until we, we find a place where we alone can succeed and feel fulfilled. And through that zigzagging, people tend to become broader and more like generalists. Now, there is one part of this which I was, I was surprised by, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be quite fits, but explain it, which is this Air Force Academy uh, um, example that you have. Uh, in, in education, so there was this um, incredible study at the Air Force Academy where students uh, go in, they have to take three math classes in succession, and they are randomized to professors. And this study was looking at the impact of professor quality. And what these researchers found was that the way to produce the best immediate achievement, which was to teach narrow specialized skills, systematically undermines students for future classes. Uh, are you saying that, you know, if you're good at something in the short run, you pay a price in the long run. But you're saying only if in the short run what you're doing is you're, you're getting that good performance by narrowing yourself down. That's right. So and the quickest, the absolute quickest way to get improvement, whether this is a cognitive skill or a physical skill, like in the sports world, is to teach what's called closed skills or using procedures where you teach people specialized techniques for whatever they're doing, whether they're playing soccer or they're solving a math problem. But to build a scaffolding where their knowledge becomes flexible, you want to teach so-called making connections knowledge, where they have to draw together these broad concepts and instead of learning to just execute something, they learn how to match a strategy to a problem. And it doesn't matter if it's a math problem, a geopolitical problem, or a soccer problem. And that's, that's the fundamental basis on which they can layer these other skills. You talk about how it may be, we may be in an age where you need kind of continuous coaching, no matter what it is you do. How would one achieve that? Yeah, well, I think, I think what we already have gotten pretty good at inside the sports world, for example, we need to bring to, to other areas of work. Because, again, this, this idea that we learn who we are in practice, not in theory, what we have to do is act and then think, basically. You do things and then you reflect on them, what they say about you, and you zigzag accordingly instead of kind of following the, the commencement speech advice to decide who you'll be in 20 years and march confidently toward that. And I think having a, a coach can really help you and remind you to reflect on what you've done as you try to optimize your own match quality. So life is a lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error with plus reflection. Um, if, if you were to leave people with one piece of advice, what would it be? I think if they, I think that sometimes the fastest way to become proficient in something undermines your long-term development. So before your eyes progress often can make you very good at a specialized task, but 
Nowadays, tasks that are very specialized are in danger of getting automated. So if you want this flexible knowledge, we've gone from the industrial economy to the knowledge economy, now to the creativity economy, you need to be able to do new things. And that's a slower form of learning where you have to learn across disciplines and build these conceptual models. And you believe that's true even in the world of technology? Because, you know, a lot of people feel that the hottest place to be is to be in technology, which is often quite narrow. Coding is a very yeah. narrow uh, um, business. Yeah, I, I didn't know, but then I looked at the research in this, and what it shows is that, for example, in studies of millions of patents, the technological innovators who make the biggest impacts are not the ones who have drilled down the deepest, but the ones who have spread their work across a huge number of different technological classifications, according to the U.S. Patent Office. Those are the people who can solve these, these problems that we don't even know kind of exist yet, basically. You have a four-month old. When, uh, when he or she becomes old enough for you to start instructing uh, him or her, what will you do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do exactly what, what I said, which is I'm going to expose them to a lot of different things. If, if the kid, if my son wants to specialize, that's fine. But all these, these tales of prodigies like Tiger Woods and Mozart, their parents were responding to their displays of interest and prowess, not the reverse, like it's often told. So I'll try to expose him broadly and be that coach who helps him reflect on what he did so that he can march toward his, his optimal match quality.